with River wants to answer. Um, it seems like a lot of our you know, non-political institutions are geared toward, you know, kind of typical profit-oriented corporations. And I was wondering for all of you, like, what's one like legal or public policy change that would make your projects easier to accomplish, other than overthrowing capitalism? <laughs> Hi, um, are pl platform co-ops uh, substituting the state, uh, or what is the role in the, of the state in uh, platform co-ops? Uh, well, this is, this is a complex uh, question. It's about the infrastructure. You know, you, you've got a beautiful fair phone here, but it's, you're constantly spied by Google. Uh, there's, uh, you know, phone Zenit project by Tutanota from Germany that is uh, providing a secure connection peer to peer, but then still at the end point the uh, communication is intercepted by people who own the fiber optics. So how can you tackle that and how you can forge alliances which will be much deeper than just, uh, of course we have to tackle certain issues, but then there is always a gap, there is always a weak spot that is uh, being exploited, and this is why shared economy has been turned into a capitalist angle. So how do you tackle this? I'm sure I could take the questions about the state most easily. Um, I, I think the easiest way to answer that is to start just by looking at history. I, I don't know the, uh, much about the history about uh, the British government's relationship with co-op, so I'm sure it's very interesting. Uh, but in the United States, um, you know, in the Great Depression, for instance, the government turned to cooperatives as a tool for, for addressing poverty. It set up, for instance, rural electric cooperatives to provide electricity. It set up, meaning provided technical assistance, provided funding, this sort of thing, uh, to, uh, uh, to bring electricity to rural areas. Uh, those same, that same infrastructure still provides electricity for 75% of the territory of the United States. Um, also set up uh, a great deal of the infrastructure around uh, agricultural cooperatives, which are still one of the dominant engines of agriculture in the country. Um, uh, it, in particular, those cooperatives were extremely important in the, in the South among African American farmers who didn't have access to, um, to standard markets because of, um, because of white supremacy. And so uh, uh, the government, as well as foundations like the Ford Foundation, were actively involved in seeing, in recognizing cooperatives as a, as a strategy for um, for addressing issues of poverty and discrimination, and provided, again, technical assistance, legal frameworks, um, which uh, means just allowing people to incorporate co cooperatives easily and appropriately, uh, and, and financing to help get them started. Um, these same strategies are being used today by offline cooperatives, uh, or in the, largely in the offline you know, co-op world. For instance, New York City, uh, has recently both allocated funds for business development uh, around cooperatives, uh, but also worker cooperatives in particular, but also has created, uh, t has taken steps toward ensuring that, um, that there's priority for cooperatives in, um, in government uh, uh, contracts. Uh, and, and the rationale for this is that the, the city has, a, has an incentive to ensure that the value of its contracts remains in the city and cooperatives do that. So, so I, th I don't think that co-ops are uh, necessarily a replacement for the state. Um, I, I, uh, for instance, Michelle Bowens of the P2P Foundation talks about this concept of the partner state, which doesn't govern cooperatives, which part of one of those cooperative principles is independence from government, but that facilitates the development of self-organizing enterprise. And I think it's important to help articulate um, the value of this enterprise to people in public office I found uh, in traveling around the world that when one does that, actually, there's a lot of ignorance uh, in, in political structures about this. Um, when you're able to make the case, you can make some progress. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done there. I think it's really hard right now to build ethical tech. Like, I mean, I mean Fairphone is one example, but I mean, even at WikiHouse, like, it's really hard. Because at some layer in like the stack of what you what you need, you do end up kind of using either Google Docs or Amazon Cloud service, serv services, um, and you end up essentially offshoring layers of your infrastructure, um, and because there are not uh, good enough alternatives yet for those. 
So I think um, there is a, whilst I think there is a need to um, look at having more cooperatives, like showing in, you know, your kind of list of, a list of them, I think we need to start thinking as well about how we can really scale some of these cooperatives so that you create enough of a demand for alternative infrastructure layers. Because at the moment there's not that demand and I think that's partly looking at how can we make people give a damn about this? Because let's face it, most people do. <laughs> or don't really understand exactly what's going on. They feel very helpless about, about it. So I think there's a need to really look at um, what are the user needs that can be answered through platform co um, through cooperatives. And I think that as we move into uh, a kind of even more into this kind of Internet of Things uh, world, that they will it will become more obvious where the needs are, particularly around having far more like local services that provide us with the kind of control and local information that we need. I don't. I actually don't think monopoly, these huge monopolies can provide us with the services that some of us actually really want. Um, but this answers then about the role of the state, or I think it was what policy change I think um, it would really help with this, is for, I think, governments to form or either an, an institution or a group that sole mandate is to fund open source software projects because I think that would unlock insane amounts of innovation. And I think it's also about unlocking finance to fund civic entrepreneurs, because also what this is looking at is like the new civics, so like the nations of the world, like to give them money to live for a certain amount of time to go and think and um, build some of this stuff and start it, because it's really hard to um, you know, make a crust working on some of this stuff. But also, if you want to form an open source software project that scales, that's also super tough right now. So I think there is a real need to have um, some change to uh, yeah, get way more funding into these projects. Um, and there is, if anyone can help me out here, there's a lady called Nadia, I can't remember her surname, I can tell anyone who's interested, who at the moment is being sponsored by the Ford Foundation to look at how open source um, software projects are funded. I don't remember her surname, but I can tell you all if anyone's interested. But she's written some very interesting pieces, ironically on Medium, uh, but really interesting pieces on uh, some of the issues for software um, developers and uh, design teams. That I think I would recommend everyone reads. Um, and the third one, data licenses. So I think one of the big things about uh, design patterns for, or different kind of terms and conditions is that we need to build and pilot them to learn how do they get enforced. So there's a big similarity between data licenses and creative commons that I think we, are, we can learn from. Um, I'm really excited about modular legals um, and there are some really great lawyers looking at this and how you can have modular legals that travel with something like a license. And some of that work is being done in the blockchain space, which is why I'm interested in that. Um, but at the moment, we are just about to start a project in Bristol looking at using data licenses with real problems, with real people. And I think we're going to learn loads. So I think it's about piloting them and, and learning through doing. On the infrastructure, I think we need to be quite pragmatic right now, given that you, um, that the problem is really we have this diversity of great projects and um, and we have to be supportive of one another. But if you if you overdo this, you basically boost your boost your costs. It's, it's, since everything is so small, working on such small scales, um, you have a lot of um, not very efficient processes in there, and that's really I think. Uh, something where you, you have to choose and you have to be transparent about and have to make clear what your intentions are, but get, a, get something running that works and that is at an affordable price so that you reach out a certain customer base. And that's relating also, also to the other point. Our feeling, and in particular, I mean, I can speak of the German context, um, it's very, very uh, pitiful what uh, so far government support um, offers for corps like us. Um, 
and um, we realized actually what we want to do is rely on the crowd and do it ourselves and we we check we we uh, screened the support schemes but realized there's not much happening um, we're trying to lobby a little bit with partners but um, that takes time I think what we need is pilots that are really successful that show that this works that uh, that is actually something that needs to be supported and that is even able to support other smaller <coughs> st startups and players and I think that's the way to go we really need to have some some boosted pi pilots uh, I think all the speakers have done a fantastic job of uh, portraying a very kind of optimistic view of platform co-ops, you know, take over the world and they're through capitalism. Uh, obviously, you know, I, I, fully, I fully support you and believe that yes, we are at that moment. And I guess that everybody in the room is sort of thinking, yeah, maybe. Um, but uh, just in case there are any dialectical materialists in the room, uh, you know, could anybody, could, could everybody kind of uh, just say what they think has changed about the kind of the economy? which makes this a relevant idea now, and I think it's come out a lot in what you said, but I think, you know, if it could just be put into the format of a rallying cry for your troops about to go into battle, why should we do it now when we ran into the machine guns before? Uh, that would, I would really like to hear just a list of those reasons. My question to the panel, but maybe it's Nathan as well. Um, how do we mainstream this message, these great ideas? How can we get this beyond the, the tech sector, even beyond the New York Times, out to the more mainstream media. Paul? It's a question for Fernando. Uh, it's more, more, more like a curiosity. How do you, usually the open source uh, projects, they, uh, the founders, they don't care much if, the, if, the, if, the, if other people use the, the source code because it's not like that. But in your case, it's kind of a competitor. Like if another person in Germany uh, used the the same, the same software, then become a direct, you know, become a direct competitor. And is it, is it many people doing uh, the same thing that you're doing? Funny enough, that followed on for about the third question, which is that it's all very nice to see this, and I'll include myself in this criticism, is that, you know, it's nice and middle class and it's highly educated. Um, I do quite a lot of work on the East, in the East End with old people, with community gardens, that kind of thing, although I'm actually a technologist. So um, what my question is and comment is, how do we get some of this stuff to reach down? For example, reaching down in the East End would be reaching to the unbanked, who actually can't use credit cards, can't use debit cards because they haven't got anything. But they would find a lot of these things extremely beneficial you know, for example, swapping furniture or everything like that instead of dumping it on the road. So that's, I think, uh, quite a, um, a complicated question and quite a useful one. Thanks, everyone, for those uh, great thoughts. Um, I really have a, a sort of question about whether um, you can say a little bit more about how platform co-ops help um, with the efficiency of governance at all, or with bureaucracy, if, if they do. Just uh, maybe some examples. Hi everyone, um, my name's Ian, I'm from the co-op uh, and the new digital team that we're getting started at in Manchester. Um, so I'm kind of interested in how I think VC funding has a lot to say uh, about the sort of growth of a lot of the new platforms and products we've seen. Um, you know, I'm not sure that tech is necessarily the hard bit mm. in all of this. So I'm really interested in specific what other funding models are out there. You mentioned like crowdfunding you lead towards and um, monthly subscription fees, but <coughs> I'm kind of interested, you know, where are we going to find our 50 billion? So first of all, the directly from one question about how we <coughs> manage our open source code. I mean, so far nobody has used it yet, and I think one part of it is we're still in the developing phase, and parts of it are, let's say, um, still quite a mess. Of, uh, if you look at the code, um, it, it's not really perfect as a ref, uh, as a tool that can be forked and just applied. But what we are doing is um, we have the. Well, first of all, we have the intention, and fortunately it's, it's, it's happening. Um, we want to cooperate with other cooperatives in other countries who pick up, pick up um, the code, the idea, um, or bring in their ideas and um, make it all together a multinational cooperative owned by users on the ground, adapted in every country um, 
separately and in a, in a different way, but um, being together as one, uh, having one common software code and having one common um, also marketplace at some point where we can ex uh, facilitate exchange. And fortunately, we have a group in the UK who already created their own co-op, created their own community, and are pushing for uh, launching from on the UK. So that's really, really cool. And um, there are groups in other countries who are interested in this as well. For me, my dream is that, um, and this comes to the question of how we reach out to marginalized groups, um, that um, this model, for example, can be um, transferred to friends in African countries, for example, or other countries where people have, <coughs> have more difficult situations in terms of uh, what financial, uh, <coughs> financial means. Um, and that's actually where Fernando came from, from my point of view. Um, it was, um, it's the idea started in, in South Africa and other African countries. And I think um, what we need to have is a, is a structure where cooperatives work on eye level, it doesn't matter where they're based, and have a common pool where they share resources and share software code so that um, those people who know what people on the ground need um, create their specific uh, Cool. Yeah, so that's what I can say on this one. And maybe um, on the financing question, because it's, it's such a core thing, and for us it's, it's such a pain. Um, yeah, I mean, we have this trade policy, we don't work with VCs, and it's really because we want this to keep the model clean, to make sure that even um, that, that at no point in time there will be anybody taking control and having big, uh, big stakes and wanting to make more money out of this. Um, this puts us really in, the, in, a, in a tough position and there are other approaches where you maybe work with specific partners who have themselves co-op models and where you think, okay, we can accept money from them. Um, we are open maybe to loan models if we really ensure that they are, have no influence on governance. Um, so we are exploring these kind of things, but so far from our side, I, I, I haven't seen it. I've seen other... Um, <coughs> Other initiatives doing doing great stuff, um, also issuing some kind of supportive shares or supportive equity, um, which has no say. Um, there, there are quite a couple of, of instruments, but um, I haven't seen the real good solution to get the fifty billion dollars. And I mean, fifty billion is maybe too much, but a hundred million, I think, is actually some kind of. I mean, if you look at what startups are are collecting and, and what they are pushing using to push into the market and to um, that's what you have to compete with. Mm -hmm. um, I think the strength is maybe we gather just a hundred million people yeah. and those hundred million people help us to push into the market and yeah maybe that's enough. Uh, I'm really excited to see what the co-op digital are gonna do. Uh, partly about building a, like a you know I so I was working um, up there recently on a project um, so uh, I mean, I'm looking forward to see what to see what they will do, and they recently have just launched the kind of co-op digital. So yeah, everyone should look at their blogs. I think it's going to be very interesting. So if anyone doesn't know, but it was kind of the, a core team from um, Government Digital Service um, with Mike Bracken, Tom Newsmore that went over to uh, the co-op in Manchester um, to really revitalise the kind of digital group um, within that. And in terms of the finance uh, piece, I'm. Um, I think that some of this has to come from a kind of VC model, actually, but that we need kind of 10-year exits rather than like three-year exits. And I think we need to be thinking about how that kind of funding structure can work for groups that we want to be around for a very, very long time um, and not have this kind of uh, disruptive startup thing going on all the time. Like, disruption is not an ideal. And I think... <laughs> That we ought to. Um, I think there's some very interesting groups like Blue Yard over in Berlin, who are looking at much longer term investments. Again, some of that is in um, more Beyonce infrastructure, uh, blockchain infrastructure. But um, the <laughs> I think there are some uh, interesting new groups forming around that, and um, some quite radical individuals within particular VC firms um, that are looking at much longer term plays. But also I think we have to look at actually how we want to pay for things like the internet. And I don't mean to segue into an enormous topic here, but to touch very lightly, I have never seen so many camera stickers and um, 
ad blockers than ever before, and than than ever before, sorry, and certainly now on like uh, Wired, on uh, what other sites have I been on recently? But anyway, they have these kind of big blockers that say, "We can see you're running an ad blocker. Consider paying us a dollar or day, a dollar a day, or turn your ad blocker off." Like we rely on adverts to pay for providing this, um, you know, this content. And I think we need to think about what are the ways that. Um, we would collectively be willing to pay for content or services. And browsers like Brave are really interesting. Um, so Brave is a, uh, a browser that does like do not track by default. It, has, it actually only gives you ethical ads, and I can't tell you the terms of what ethical ads is because I don't remember them, but um, it also pays you a nano payment for looking at for clicking on an ethical ad. So the payment is shared between you and Brave. Really interesting. Also projects like Pro Tip by Chris Ellis, which is looking at uh, essentially nano payments of Bitcoin for content that you've watched. So if you've watched a video on YouTube 10 times that week, then you can consider giving a nano payment to the creator <coughs> of that content. So thinking about other ways <coughs> of actually having fair finance for content production, I think we need to go back to some of those questions and whether we need things like design standards for advertising. I won't go any further into that, but I'm very interested in if we believe in a free network and we want more, you know, we, this stuff, everything costs money. It is an enabler, and I think we shouldn't forget that. Uh, and to answer the question about how we reach with these projects, coming particularly from my point of view as a designer, the London design uh, shows are going to happen in maybe a month's time hundreds of thousands of students have been working their asses off for the past year to present work to get jobs and I'm always I'm afraid really disheartened to see so many projects about connected devices that are essentially creepy surveillance objects that the only way they would ever be real in the world is to collect personal data off everyone and yeah I mean there's this kind of thing going on in design that seems to be that Silicon Valley has almost like a monopoly on good design ideas, which is really, really false. But I think when you look at the kind of issues that many students are addressing, many of those issues don't, don't either exist or they haven't gone and looked at kind of uh, studied real people and what real people need. Um, you know, our sort of post-war unions have never been in such crises like our labour unions. There's so many big problems, like we have a shrinking middle class and we know that that's a huge problem if we want good public services. And these are some issues that I think particularly designers and developers need to be looking at. And so I think there is a thing about going back to um, institutions that educate young uh, creatives to look at how do you do projects for the furthest first those individuals who are uh, not digi as digitally literate as, as they might be, um, who maybe don't even ha have access to the internet. And for me, that's much more about doing projects well in the UK, making them open, and then individuals elsewhere in the world can hopefully look at those projects as inspiration and make them for themselves locally. And that comes from WikiHouse's principle, which is it's easier to ship recipes than cakes and biscuits. Um, rather than making something for somewhere else in the world, do it really well for your community, make it open and share. Um, but I think there is, it's, it's a really complicated question, as you said, but something I'm quite passionate about is how can we start to see some of these problems being critically and intelligently kind of engaged with at a school level, because that's when it starts. That's when you start making decisions about what you want to do next and how you want to make your money as well. So. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, what you say about, about micropayments reminds me of, of uh, Ted Nelson's uh, uh, computer lib dream machines uh, uh, from the 1970s, this vision of what the internet would look like. And, um, and it included, it, I mean, he just thought it was obvious that you would go to a web page or whatever it was called on Xanadu and uh, you would make a payment. Uh, it's interesting how we have kind of buried and um, and hidden the economics of our online experience, and I wonder what power co-ops have to awaken the trust uh, to allow us to to, to make that more uh, transparent, forthright again. Um, uh, and 
you know, I think that spirit of like not starting from scratch is really important for a lot of these questions. Remembering that even though this like, I this like concept of platform cooperativism is like fairly new and it's been interesting that we haven't had deep conversations uh, or, or there's been some missing some some uh, uh, pieces missing from conversations about corporate ownership structures and online economy. Um, that we really don't have to start from scratch, and there's some interests, some really important places to build. Um, in the question of needs and like where is this coming from, you know, co-ops have always been really successful at meeting needs that um, that that the capitalist markets don't meet, and that's the place to start. You know, that's food deserts, that's um, the unbanked, that's you know people who aren't re receiving services who could use them who want them. Uh, uh, and and those are opportunities that co-ops can fill. They can fill them more nimbly, um, uh, more successfully with greater trust than than other kinds of markets can. Um, and so I think that it, that history is in itself an opportunity. Um, what institutions can support that? You know, what institutions can help mainstream? You know, I would be interested to know what what networks and and organizations bring you to that neighborhood in the East End? What networks and institutions are already there? Uh, is it you know churches, is it labor unions, is it what kinds of community associations are already there? Those are the ones I want to start building with. Uh, for instance, our work in, in New York, uh, and, and increasingly now I'm doing out in Colorado, involves starting with uh, often labor unions, or in our case, since our labor uh, movement is, 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 a, is kind of a wreck right now, uh, these more informal labor organizations that are popping up uh, that are trying to, to organize workers and who are seeing already seeing co-ops as a strategy for finding a new and more effective business model, uh, especially as the, the classical legal structure of the labor union is becoming harder and harder to pursue given the political climate. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, some labor unions in the U.S. like that, like SEIU, Major Service Workers Union, AFL-CIO, you know, these are the big ones, are, are taking up um, cooperatives and in some cases platform cooperatives. Um, and I think these questions again apply to uh, issues of, of governance and financing. Um, in the past, it's worth looking at these stories and how um, large-scale cooperatives have been developed. Often they've had to develop their own financing tools and their own financing institutions. Um, and that's like, you know, that's hard, but it's totally doable. And it's been interesting over the last year to see how many new projects are coming out of the woodwork. Um, you know, for instance, one, one week I heard, I, I did an interview with these folks in New Zealand, Lumio, who have this platform for decision making, and they just figured out how to, how to create an invest, uh, uh, financing structure that preserved their cooperative thing and got them some money. And, and it was a neat model using this thing called redeemable preference shares. And then the next week I was meeting with some, these two women founders in, in, uh, in Boulder where I live, and they had actually turned that same model, not knowing anything about co-ops, into a platform using the USA Jobs Act that enables equity crowdfunding uh, uh, to go on platforms. And, uh, and, and I've seen a number of uh, projects emerging that are kind of taking old forms, finding new ways to apply them to this new ecosystem. Um, so I think that, that problem of, of financing is hard, but I also think it's more solvable uh, uh, than we think. There are also, in the meantime, hybrid opportunities. For instance, the SEIU project that I uh, mentioned briefly a second ago um, uses a hybrid model where the platform is funded by, uh, by kind of conventional VC funding, um, and then the labor pool is controlled by a cooperative. And these are nurses doing high-value home direct-to-consumer work, <coughs> direct-to-client work, whatever you want to call it. And um, so they're, they're experimenting with hybrid forms. Uh, to, to figure out how to, uh, uh, to get a project going. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there, though one has to be very careful in their learning about that. In terms, of, in, in terms of governance, too, I think there's a lot to be learned. There are, this is maybe in some ways the new space, though I think we want to look back to our histories of different ways that different kinds of organizations have been governed and experiment and innovate there. Um, I, I think uh, when we're talking about uh, entirely online memberships and communities, um, that's, that seems like a very hard problem. These are huge numbers of people. 
um, and and they have various uh, uh, rain, you know some of them are very involved in the plat platform, very dependent on it. Some of them are not, um, but really that's not a problem that we that is totally new. You know, on the one hand, one can say, oh, we've got to you know use all sorts of awesome liquid democracy tools, you know, where we have, and that's great. I mean, I think that I think there's a lot of room for innovation, but you know, for instance larger democratic organizations like labor unions, like different forms of government, um, uh, uh, like membership organizations, have existed with very, very large numbers in the past. Um, the large cooperatives exist and manage to govern themselves fairly democratically, um, you know, to varying degrees. And so I think the safest place to start is just kind of learn from those examples and recognize that these problems aren't insurmountable and that in many cases they've been addressed before, and we just need to translate that social knowledge um, into the online experience, rather than, you know, rather than uh, doing this, again, this Silicon Valley trick where you pretend that everything is new and has never been done before. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, if I, I can totally, and the, the also the, the governance issues, like some of those, you don't need like multiple new digital tools or innovation in those areas, I think, um, necessarily all the time it kind of overcomplicates it and I think we have to remember that inside the platform like the all cooperative there are people there too and that actually having setting up like a really good culture within the team that you're building the thing is so crucial and um, the governance I think kind of comes after setting that culture and that's the really hard bit and I think that's where just I wanted to say like as a design as a designer sitting here that I think I should is that people are the hardest bit of this like the people that work inside the teams of the cooperatives and the users that your thing is trying to serve and trying to make sure that what you make is useful for them. Um, and so I think that's as much as we can talk about all the fancy things here. Um, it's ultimately like the humans in the loop that make this uh, quite so damn difficult. <laughs> Do you want to? Well, I would add two, two controversial. Yeah positions maybe. Yeah. Um, the one is on the governance where I really think, I mean that's my point of view, I think mm -hmm. we should really think about what do we actually do we want to achieve. Do we want to create models where everybody spends all of their life <coughs> deciding about this business, this business, this no. business and this business? <laughs> yeah. yeah really. Yeah. Or do you want businesses that actually do uh, stop, <coughs> stop, stop trying taking advantage of us? I think that's what we want. I mean, I mean, this is why I think we need to design models where actually those people who feel affected can have a voice, but most people can just say, well, I know that if there's something happening, I can, I can start using my voice. And um, that's why I think employees are very important, because they've got the direct insight. They, they know what daily work is happen uh, what, what's happening in daily work. But I don't think, like, at least if you have like these platform co-ops where you have large numbers of users, um, I don't think that every user needs to now um, become a controller and, um, and designer and whatever and decide about everything. Uh, that's really not um, the need. Uh, yeah, there's so much on that one. I, I think yeah. governance needs to be smart about this. And the other point is about the, the potential that is coming. I think there's there's a potential and there's a threat, and I think the potential is that we see a lot of initiatives growing. The internet has enabled a lot, other technologies have enabled a lot, um, maybe blockchain is going to enable <coughs> new stuff, but um, the challenge that I see right now is that there's a huge diversity of things coming up, and this diversity means people are focusing on their little thing, making it nice, but um, the big players in the platform <coughs> world and the multinational corporation world all together are very good at pooling resources, extracting them from everyone and putting more powerful and more powerful actors into place that destroy everything that gets in their way. And I think um, we need to think about how we do we get strong entities and they don't need to be centralized, powerful, hierarchical monsters but they need to be strong, and I think that's why we need a lot of cooperation and a lot of networking and, and, and maybe also more focus on, on, on pilot product projects and on strong projects instead of more and more and more and more new platforms and new, new initiatives. But yeah. If, if I can just say one thing, because I know the question about governance was about can, the, can these platforms make it more efficient? And actually, 
suspect there's a way in which they can. And, and this is kind of roundabout. It's not a new gizmo. But it's the idea that, um, that when we are able to direct our participatory energy toward the stuff that really affects us and that we know, we'll have a more smoothly running society, right? Right now, you know, in the United States, I think a lot of the, like, crazy stuff that's happening with, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders on the one hand and uh, Donald Trump on the other. Yeah, Bernie Sanders, when he first started running, he had support worker co-ops on the bottom of his, of his uh, platform on his website, and that's gone now, but uh, it's buried in there somewhere. But, um, but uh, the, you know, people are so frustrated, I think, because they feel such a lack of control over the economy, and so they want, they're exerting a lot of energy to try to get a strong, powerful, strong man at the top uh, uh, to, to change everything the way they want want things to be changed. I think things would be different if people felt that they had more touch points into the places that really affect their lives, their workplaces, um, their, you know, the, the online communities that they're participating in. They, you know, maybe we would, we would have a world where politicians like matter less because we would be working our way up in much more efficient ways, directing our energy toward the stuff that we can actually affect and that we actually know about. So, so that's not really a technology so much as, as a theory that more appropriate democracy and social arrangements you know, will ultimately lead to a better functioning system. And this, is, this platform co-op idea is just kind of a subset of that broader idea that deeper democracy at every level you know, is going to end up creating a healthier overall system. My name is Constance Nevin, um, and cooperative workers cooperative, and we support young people to set up their workers cooperatives. To respond to um, a few points, the um, reach out to the mainstream and to more people, and what Harry pointed out really uh, fairly, the why, the question why. Um, do you think that there is a very important responsibility from anyone starting cooperatives today to formulate the why? as an educational um, mission, as a cooperative. One of the principles of cooperation is education and training. And um, I think that cooperation or cooperatives today are really about reclaiming an economy that has been taken away from people and is today re-injecting the question of people <coughs> inside of the economy. And this particularly speaks of digital and like the platform cooperative bit that, you know, Digital products and services are exerting like an ever greater influence on how power is distributed among us. Like what rights and capabilities the majority of us have. And to quote my friend Richard Pope, software is politics. So this means this stuff is about how we will live, how we're going to love, learn, understand, share, all of those things. And so for me, but this is really what future do we want to build and live in? That is the kind of piece I would say. <laughs> well, yeah, in 20 seconds, I would say um, it's not so much about arguments and rationality. I think it's about showing how much fun it is. I think it's having fun, doing good stuff, doing it together, yeah. and showing it to people. Yeah. Just saying we're good, doing things better, join us, and you're going to have as much fun yeah. as we. And, and I think that's more my question about how do we speak about it, and how the inspiring bit is very important. I think we don't inspire uh, people enough, and, and especially in the political um, sphere. But I think it's not to have your answer right now. My, my question was more about how do we take responsibility for inspiring people, empowering people who feel really disillusioned economically, politically, um, socially, um, with cooperatives. Anyway. Well, my, my own theory of that is just telling cooperative stories, you know, telling stories about the challenges of, of, of this work, the adventure of it, invite people into that adventure, you know, don't be shy about how hard it is, you know, and, and just show like this is, I mean, what the, the story Felix told us is an incredible story that's still ongoing and I'm on the edge of my seat and, and you know, I'm just trying to tell more of those stories. You know, I also think too, you know, a lot of us intuitively feel that the internet is already ours. You know, we pour so much of our personal information into it. We pour all of our family pictures into it. We're, we're, it knows everything about us, whatever it is. Um, and and we, we know how much we've created it too. 
you know, we've made it awesome. We've made it fun. Like Facebook would suck without us, right? And and uh, and this is just, I think, a call to to make it ours more fully, you know, and to make sure that the that the that the nature of the beast is, you know, what we kind of intuitively feel it is, uh, that that it that it lives up to its potential, and that it and that it um, uh, that that it really uh, reflects the way in which it would be nothing. Uh, uh, this whole economy and this this uh, this whole creature and culture uh, would be nothing without us. I, th I think like I think your point like picks up on an interesting thing, which is about like a bigger like as I mentioned before, kind of theories of change piece, which is like what stories do we need to tell to make that that change to make a kind of um, services system culture change around this? And I think some of them are like we already know, like that um, you know. I don't think anyone in this room would probably think that Twitter really understands why they use Twitter and why we think Twitter is awesome, <laughs> because they've inserted so many blimmin' adverts and like love hearts and moments and whatever else into it, into their into their platform. And if, if Twitter was set up as a cooperative, I think it would look quite different and probably still just be 100, you know, 140 characters, whatever. Um, but finding those kind of mundane everyday stories, but making them really relevant to people, because I think at the moment there is. Um, a real feeling of, well, there's nothing much I can do about this, or like, so what? And I think it's about finding the stories to change that into a, into a challenge and, um, and to have kind of ones that more cooperatives can join so it's like fewer bits and more kind of uh, a, a, bigger, a bigger voice, I guess. I just wanted to ask you, and um, yeah, if we could all just say thank you to both the speakers. That I know you all had a really, really busy schedule, and you were able to come, and it's really amazing. So really, thank you, and to Newspeak House for hosting us, and for Outlandish for making this possible. So if we can do a round of applause.